66 million years ago, a mountain fell from the sky. This is a 10 kilometer asteroid that came crashing down and impacted our planet with the same energy of over a million nuclear bomb blasts. This turned the sky black. It set off a wave of mega tsunamis that were higher than, than skyscrapers. It to set off volcanoes and earthquakes, fires that ranged all across the land. This was a bad day for planet Earth. This was also the day that is the least favorite day for my son, my four-year-old son, who um, loves dinosaurs. All of this mayhem that was unleashed on our world created a mass extinction, a mass extinction that eventually wiped out the dinosaurs. Some of you have probably heard uh, scientists talk about a new mass extinction that is on the horizon. This new mass extinction is not something that you see on a, a NASA uh, radar screen of a new asteroid that's coming crashing towards our planet. Rather, this new mass extinction is actually looking at us in the mirror. We are the new asteroid. Scientists estimate that extinction rates caused all around us on the planet today are as high as the rates that were observed during this day, 66 million years ago, that were observed some, during some of the biggest mass extinctions in human history. It's sort of hard for us to get our heads around the gravity of this situation. We as humans sometimes can be a slightly self-involved species, but uh, if we had the interest in asking and the capabilities of asking, we ask the biology that shares the planet with us, the biology besides us on Earth, it would have a very different story to tell us. If we ask tigers or elephants or lions, well, they would tell us a story that feels a lot more like that day, 66 million years ago. Now, I'm a marine biologist, so I want to pivot a little bit. A lot of this science, a lot of this research about a emerging mass extinction is drawn from data on land, terrestrial ecosystems. I want us to ask in our time together, is a mass extinction entering our oceans? And that's an incredibly important question. The reason it's so important, at least one reason it's so important, is because if you took all of the space on our planet where life can exist and you added all of that space up, 90% of the habitable space on our planet, of all of life's space, would be oceans. In essence, then, what we're asking is, is a mass extinction leaking into the 90% of our planet where life can exist? This is obviously a question that we want a good answer to, right? Before we reach forward towards that answer, I'd like us to reach back a bit. This is a timeline of extinction, a timeline of human-driven extinctions. It takes us about 50,000 years back. Now, the first data that I have up here are extinctions that were caused by people on land. You'll notice a couple things on this graph. First, that there's a lot of green on the graph. That shows that the body count of extinction is quite high. The other interesting thing about this graph is the dynamic of extinction. There's a pulsed nature to extinction. Essentially, extinction follows in our footprints. We arrived to Australia and we saw a pulse of extinction. We headed out to the Americas about 14,000 years ago. We saw a pulse of extinction. Then 500 years ago, we were everywhere. Globalization had really ramped up. We were about every niche on the planet. And we saw this gigantic spike of extinction over here. This is what scientists are talking about when they mention a brand new and emerging mass extinction on our planet. So what's the story for oceans? That's the land data. Let's put up the oceans data. A very different story. There's a lot of silence in this timeline. All the way up into this point, to the last 500 years. In the last 500 years, we finally see the first blip on the radar screen of extinction in the oceans. If we can zoom in a bit in the last 500 years for extinction, you can really draw out this story very well. And the contrast in this story, on land, we see this skyrocketing rate of extinction. In the oceans, it's a very different story. We have an, essentially this lovely, beautiful, flat line for extinction in the oceans. And this is wonderful news. This is incredibly optimistic, right? If you actually add up the numbers, in the last 500 years on land, we've seen over 500 animal species that have gone extinct. In the same time period, we've only seen 15 animal extinctions in the oceans. This is a view of some of the faces of the ocean animal 15, what I sometimes call the oceans 15. Now, how, 
how good, how stable, how, how tenuous is this good news, right? This is truly good news for our oceans. Well, we can answer that question a bit by a hypothetical. We can take all of the animal species that are endangered in the oceans, and these are all the species that scientists say are at risk for extinction, and we can hypothetically push them extinct. If we do that, what that does is takes us from this flat line space, and it takes us skyrocketing all the way up into this space. Unfortunately, it seems that we are sitting on an extinction cliff in the oceans. There are hundreds of species, unfortunately, amazing species, ecologically important species, things like sea otters and sea turtles and sharks and dolphins and whales and porpoises that are hanging their flippers or their fins just off the edge of this cliff. It would be all too easy for us to create a mass extinction in our oceans. So how do we prevent that from happening? How do we keep a mass extinction from leaking into our oceans? The answer for me is to figure out what happened here. What happened in the green line on land when things went from this comfortable flat line of background extinctions and then arced up into this mass extinction space? I'll tell you what I think the answer is, what changed about that time. So this period here, this shift in the extinction curve really sort of changed about the time of the Industrial Revolution. Now, it was a very different period for humans' relationship with life on land. Um, this is a timeline, again, takes us back the same time period, 50,000 years. You can see the ch changing influence that we've had on both terrestrial, on land-based, and on aquatic, on marine ecosystems. We've been driving, as we looked at, extinction for a long time on land. Much of that early extinction, though, was caused by direct hunting. In this very space we were sharing today, there used to be mammoths and gigantic ground sloths that were three times taller than I am, right? When we arrived to North America, hunting, direct hunting of these species, contributed to their extinction. Now, if you fast forward from that period all the way up to the Industrial Revolution, something changed. Our species, humanity became less interested in hunting species directly, in hunting animals directly, and hunting their homes, in modifying, altering, usurping habitats and ecosystems. And this was a game changer for extinction. You can sort of intuitively understand that, right? If you hunt a deer species, a single deer species, and you over-enthusiastically pursue that deer species, well, there's a good risk that you could drive that deer species extinct. If you instead hunt a forest, if you switch to hunting a forest and you wipe out that forest, well, you'll certainly wipe out the trees that make up that forest, but you're also putting at risk the hundreds of species that call that forest home. That ups the ante for extinction. That's what happened, and that's my opinion of what happened that triggered this mass extinction on land. So that raises some important questions, right? The questions are, is, are any of these conditions, is there any evidence that a mass extinction, or any evidence that an industrial revolution, the kind of thing that we observed on land, that that is replicating itself in the oceans? Is there any evidence that we're beginning to use the oceans in brand new ways that may affect habitats at large scales? Because if that was a trigger for extinction on land, perhaps that's also a trigger for extinction in the oceans. Let's look at some shifts. Let's look at some patterns. The first, mining. Mining in the oceans used to be a matter of science fiction, right? Now it is real. We have 300 ton waterproof robots that we can send down to the deepest parts of the ocean to grind up ocean ecosystems and, and suck up the minerals that are in them. This is a complicated one because in all of that mineral that we're extracting are things that you find in my iPhone, in my laptop, in hybrid cars, but they're also critically important habitats for myriad, truly unique deep sea species. We've already gazetted over a million square kilometers in just the decade of half, in, less, in just the last decade of half, in the oceans. That's a major shift in how people are using habitats in space in the sea. Another change, this is a track of marine offshore wind energy. We are building power plants under the sea now at a very fast pace. We're in addition to har harvesting offshore wind, we're harvesting tidal energy and wave energy, ocean thermal energy. Now, this is important. This is something we absolutely are going to want to do in our oceans because this is low carbon energy. If you really want to trigger a mass extinction in the sea, you can do that by letting climate change advance, acidify, and overheat the oceans. That's going to be bad news very soon. 
So we need this low carbon energy, but we also have to remember that this is a lot of new stuff, a lot of human hardware that's plopping itself down onto ocean ecosystems in the way of migrating ocean animals. So it's complicated also. Another change in our oceans, traffic is increasing. Here's a now familiar, this now familiar exponential growth in traffic in the sea. Traffic brings all of the same problems in the oceans that it causes on land. So you have more noise and more pollution and uh, increased movement of invasive species. You even get roadkill in the oceans. We have roadkill in the oceans. What happens is you have ships that run into whales, and some of these are endangered whale species and are truly be in being inhibited from recovery as a result of these collisions at sea. This one's also complicated, right? Everything that I'm wearing today came across on a ship that traveled in, this, in these traffics, in this mess of traffic that's out there on the Pacific. A last indicator of a changing use of the oceans. We are becoming industrial strength farmers under the oceans. This is a true game changer. Here is just exponential growth in shrimp farming, as you can see under the oceans. Dozens of other kinds of sectors of farming are increasing at the same rapidity. 2014 was the first year ever that humanity ate more fish that came from farms than came from the wild. That's huge. That's as big as the event on land when we shifted from hunting and gathering our dinner out in the wild and we started growing at home. That's what's happening now in our oceans. That's a brand new underwater revolution for agriculture, for aquaculture. This is something, this is a revolution that we absolutely need to get right. There's dirty aquaculture and there's clean aquaculture. Dirty aquaculture it has a footprint that sits right down on uh, fish nursery habitats and produces lots of pollutants. Clean aquaculture, on the other hand, produces new nutrition and new food that we're going to need for the millions of new neighbors that we're going to have on our planet. Maybe you can help take pressure off at-risk wild fish stocks. Collectively, all of these views of a changing use of the oceans add up and add up for me to suggest that we are taking baby steps forward in an industrial revolution in the oceans. Now that matters, baby steps forward. This is just beginning. My colleagues on land there that are facing off against mass extinction, trying to decide how to use science to help, they're, they're, they're facing off against a train that has like a hundred years of momentum that's bearing down on them. In the oceans, we have a decision, we have some exciting decisions to make about how this happens, if this starts. So how do we prevent a mass extinction from beginning? My solution is that we intelligently engage this industrial growth, and we see this industrial growth beginning. We're wise enough to see it coming down the train tracks for the ocean. Now that's not saying stop it, that's saying intelligently engage it, which is a different kind of answer, right? The way that I view this is that if I had a time machine and I could zoom all the way back to the beginning of the industrial revolution on land, and I could take with me all that we know about the inextricable links between human health and environmental health, well, I would have done dozens of things different in that industrial revolution on land. I would have engaged the prosperity, I would have engaged the growth, but I would have made that growth cleaner and smarter and greener. That's what we need for an industrial revolution in the oceans. We need to make it cleaner and smarter and greener. This is downtown Los Angeles, or not far from downtown Los Angeles. This is where I was born, and this is where I grew up. This once was the Wild West of America, and it's, as you can see, not so terribly wild anymore. It's easy to forget that in only 85 years, this fairly biodiverse, this fairly wild space on our planet turned into something that looks like this. As a kid that grew up, though, in this very space, a kid that wanted, like all of us, to get into nature, to recharge in nature. The only thing I had to do, though, was to jump on this very free freeway, drive down to the coastline, put on a mask, dive underwater, and, and there I was. I, I was in it. I was in the company of 200 kilogram giant sea bass. I was sharing space with 2,000 kilogram great white sharks. I could surface after one of these dives and, and just listen. To the breath of 20,000 kilogram gray whales as they migrated with their families down the coast. The Wild West was 
very much still alive. It was just alive underwater. I'm not suggesting that in 85 years, the oceans are gonna look like downtown Los Angeles, but I am suggesting that in the next century, the oceans are gonna look a lot different than they do today. And we have to anticipate that this change is coming because it is our second chance. And nature very rarely gives us second chances. This is our second chance to get industrialization right for our planet. And if we succeed in getting this right, what we can do is immense. We can stop this mass extinction that is circling in tighter and tighter in circles around us on land. We can stop this mass extinction from leaking into our oceans. Thank you.